Ah, welcome back to the channel. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many years you work in this terrible weather, it still manages to give you a fright every now and again. Just like that. Now, you didn't come here to listen to a weather report. You came today to hear a story. And as you can tell by my accent, I'm a Yorkshire man. And I'm going to tell you about a Yorkshire gal. And this gal is Margaret Clitheroe. Now, in the city of York, people said that she was a martyr. But also, other people said that she was the devil herself. Get her burnt at the stake. Now, that's not my decision. I'll leave that decision to you. Now let's get on with this story. The turmoil which followed the Reformation created an array of martyrs on both sides of the religious divide. And one such martyr was our girl here. She was known as the Pearl of York, Margaret Clitheroe. Now Margaret, was a staunch Catholic who lost her life for the religion of Catholicism. Now she was born in the beautiful city of York, Northern England, in 1556, and she was known as Margaret Middleton. Now she was the daughter of the Sheriff of York and also the church warden of St. Martin's Church on the lovely Coney Street beautiful place. And as a child, Margaret would have observed the state religion. And if you're living in England at this time, you're a Protestant, nothing else. And as this religious affiliation seemed to have continued with Margaret into the early 1570s, in which at this point, she seems to have been converted to Catholicism by the wife of Dr. Thomas Vassavour, and he is a prominent Catholic here in the city of York. By this point, Margaret had married the wonderful John Clitheroe. He was a butcher and he owned a shop on the world famous Shambles. However, keeping the people of York supplied with their fresh meat wasn't John's sole job. He also had the responsibility of reporting Catholic worshippers to the authorities. And this was all in line with the Elizabethan religious settlement. Now, as you can imagine, this would have brought immense tension in the marriage. And when Margaret began to subvert the authorities, she also stopped attending church. You can imagine the tension between John and Margaret would be rising. The 1557 injunctions in which formed part of the Elizabethan settlement had set the penalty for not attending church at 12 pence. And this was a fee that John Clitheroe had to pay for his wife's misbehavior. It was not for attending church that Margaret was first arrested in 1577. She was imprisoned twice in the city of York and her final incarceration lasted just shy of two years. And it was whilst in prison that Margaret learned to read Latin so that she could read and speak the Latin mass, which is a key element of the Catholic faith. Damn lightning. Okay, Margaret found the deaths of her fellow Catholics deeply troubling. And so, upon her release, she went on a bit of a pilgrimage at night down to the gallows of Tyburn and Nesmere, where between 1582 and 1583, five priests had been hanged. Now, though Margaret had now escaped death on multiple occasions. Her ultimate downfall would come from her desire to emulate a model which was established in the 
upper class. It was not uncommon at this time for noble families to harbour priests in their private houses or stately homes. Now, they could be put in priest holes, in secret cupboards, and by claiming that these priests were either schoolmasters or music teachers for their children, they could often keep them secret from the authorities. Indeed. Ha <laughs> ha Oh, that lightning. Anyway, indeed, this frequently proved to be effective as the noble families had the space, the finances and the support to conceal priests, often living in isolated stately homes, which rarely seemed suspicious, especially to the locals. However, this model could not effectively be applied in the middle sort. Households on the bustling shambles of York, <laughs> hardly likely. Margaret had successfully created a concealed room in her home on the shambles, along with a secret cupboard in which she had hid priests' vestments, which were the wine, the bread, all ready for their mass. But she ultimately failed to keep it secret, resulting in a frightened young boy revealing its location to the authorities. Now, when the raid happened on her home in March 1586, Margaret was subsequently arrested and she harboured these priests, which at the time was a criminal offence by death. And this was all put in place by Parliament in 1581. Now, Margaret's trial took place at the Guildhall, but her refusal by trial led to the jury automatically sentencing her to death. In a desperate attempt to persuade her to conform to trial by jury, the judges stressed the horrific barbarity of the assigned death method. But Margaret's offence was going to have, which was to be pressed to death. Meanwhile, Margaret remained firm in her conviction and continued to refuse the trial by duty, saying, I know of no offence whereof I should confess my guilt. Having made no offence, I need no trial. Perhaps she... Damn. Perhaps she was genuinely fervent, unwilling to sacrifice the religion she saw as true. Or perhaps she was determined to become a martyr like all those she had observed. Some have even claimed that her refusal stems from her unwillingness to include others in her trial, as her friends and family would need to testify in her trial. Whatever the case of her instance, she was then taken to the tall booth on the Ouse Bridge on the 25th of March, 1586, and she was pressed under approximately eight to 900 pounds. She died within 15 minutes. Margaret left behind her husband, John, and three children whom Margaret had educated in the Catholic faith. Now her son, Henry Clitheroe, he went abroad and he trained as a priest. He then came back to England as a missionary. Now opinions on Margaret Clitheroe have varied throughout the years and many of her contemporaries deem her to be a little mad in the head. In fact, Henry May, Lord Mayor of York and also Margaret's stepfather claimed that Margaret had committed suicide. Whilst this may show that he believed Margaret to have been rather stupid in her decisions. It also shows an attempt on May's behalf to preserve his position. In condemning his stepdaughter's behaviour, May showed his personal convictions distinctly differed from Margaret's, helping to bolster rather diminish 
his own position. Somewhat unusual though, Elizabeth I herself seemed to condemn the killing of Margaret, writing a letter to the people of York, in which stating that Margaret should have been spared this terrible fate, accounting for her gender alone. So there we are everybody, thank you for listening to my story on old Maggie Clifferow. So what do you think? Do you reckon she was a martyr? Or do you think she was a little bit stupid in the head? I'll leave that decision to you. Put it in the comments and I'll read it later. See you later, everybody.